And for more on the crisis in Japan and the future of nuclear power around the globe, we're joined now by Nathan Holtman. He is a professor at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland and a fellow in the global economy at the development at the Brookings Institution. Also with us, Chris Kadomsky. He is a nuclear analyst for Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Gentlemen, great to have you with us. And gentlemen, I want to just uh, mention, you know, this was some news that came late this afternoon. The head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States saying that he believes that the water level in the spent fuel containment area in one of the reactors uh, on site at uh, Fushikama in, uh, in Daiichi in Japan, that that water level had receded and that those spent fuel rods were now exposed. Uh, Chris, let's start with you. If that is indeed accurate, what does that mean? Well, that means that we're approaching a very dangerous situation if we're not already in a very dangerous situation because you and I could stand 15 feet away from those, those spent, fuel, uh, spent fuel rods. As long as there's water there, we're perfectly good to go. However, you take the water out and then we're very, very dangerous from a radiation perspective and they'll overheat and then we have problems uh, going forward with that. Nathan Holtman, this uh, Fukushima plant and Daiichi plant, if indeed, as, uh, as Chris was saying, this is a situation that cannot be resolved. I mean, what happens next to these spent fuel rods? Never mind the fuel that is in the core of the reactors. That's the fuel that would be used to actually create the uh, energy. Right. You really have two issues here, two separate issues. One is these spent fuel rods in, in the pools, which, as we've heard, one of them may have been completely dried up. And there is even talk about a second one being partially uh, dried. As, uh, as was mentioned, that actually releases a lot of radiation. And, and the, the main concern, those can be covered up with water. Uh, that would essentially alleviate the leaking of radiation from those spent fuel pools. The problem, though, is that before they're covered up, it actually complicates the job that the workers are trying to do to stabilize the three reactors which are on site. And we've had problems at three different reactors, two of which seem to have, in fact, major problems, potential breaches of their containment units. So we have a lot of disconcerting news and, and not an, maybe enough information to assess the risks at this point. Chris, what about the energy that is needed, the basic electrical energy that would be needed to have pumps in the area pumping seawater into these damaged facilities? I mean, right now, if you have no power, how do you actually even alleviate the situation when you can't even pump water in? Well, what TEPCO is doing right now is they're building a transmission line from a close to a substation or so or close proximity to the power plant to give power so there's enough power so they can start the water pumping to cool those, uh, those spent fuel pools down. And how long would something like that take? Well, they've been working on it for uh, the last 24 hours or so, if not longer, and they are, uh, just saw a news uh, clip a few moments ago that they're getting very close to getting those connected. Nathan, if indeed that that line, that power line, were to be connected, uh, is this something that could take days to fix? I mean, how long does, uh, does the plant have before that radiation becomes so deadly that you can't get close to it in order to fix it? Well, again, we have these two different issues. And when we're talking about cooling the reactor cores, one thing they've been doing in, in lieu of having that power that you're talking about connecting, uh, in lieu of having that, they've been basically pumping seawater into those reactors from essentially fire trucks. So you could imagine it like that. Uh, and that can at least temporarily keep those reactor cores, the hope is, cool. Uh, if we can keep the reactor cores cool for long enough, there was a natural decay of the radioactive uh, uh, reactions, uh, the, the decays in, in the reactor core, and that over time, over the period of, a, of maybe five days, we would get them to where it's not quite as serious an issue and the reactors might be stabilized. That doesn't address the problem of the pools, but at least that would, that would address our major concern about core meltdowns. All right, well, Chris, we were talking during the break about the implications for global nuclear energy when we take a look at what's happening in Japan. There have been 
reports about reassessments in places like Germany, Austria. I'm sure the people in charge of nuclear power in China are looking closely at what's happening in Japan. What have you been able to discover? Well, it's a very, very important issue that we want to find out about uh, in, in my research preliminary to date, which has happened since the accident has occurred to uh, just a few uh, hours ago. It seems to be that there's many, many countries that are staying the course, surprisingly. This data that I've collected since the accident was when the problem has not been as serious as it is. So as this problem seems to escalate and now we have exposure of the spent fuel pool and we have exposure of breach of the containment vessels, maybe they may well think that. But there are a lot of countries that are still going ahead and planning to go and deploy their, their, their nuclear programs. And there are several that are being a little bit hesitant. Germany, for example, has decided to shut down all of their old reactors for a three-month pause, and they'll reevaluate what's going on. Austria is similar, following a similar thing. There's a referendum for Switzerland that's going to come. They're also thinking that that perhaps is not going to go forward. But there are other countries in the world, like China and India, which had the number one and number two markets for nuclear power in the world. What option do they have? Do we want them to build a lot more coal? Not necessarily a good idea. If they deploy a lot of natural gas capacity, natural gas prices will rise. What about renewables? China and India have very, very aggressive renewable energy programs, but it's going to take a very long time for those uh, countries to ramp up so they can really deplace uh, um, or their proposed new nuclear build. Right. Some, somehow, some way to displace uh, what they already have on the books uh, in order to build nuclear power. Right. right. I'm sort of surprised to see so many countries staying the course. There are other countries, for example, like Chile. Chile is looking for uh, to deploy its first nuclear reactor or considering studies to do that. However, we see that um, uh, because of the earthquake situation in that country, they may want to reevaluate that particular uh, option. Nathan Holtman, I mean, you were hearing Chris describe the uh, sort of re the evaluation process around the world in light of what's happened in Japan. Uh, what are the implications for development? Some countries, as Chris says, they might not have an alternative. Well, that's right. I think we will be seeing different reactions happening in different countries. And in certain countries have different kinds of constituencies. The European countries uh, that were mentioned, for example, have sort of long-standing, uneasy relationships with nuclear power. Um, that said, it, a lot of the emerging economies do have a, a, a fairly big supply constraint. They really need to build out uh, generation. They've been looking at nuclear as one of the keystones of that build out. Uh, but it's true. It, the, the more that this uh, the more that this disaster escalates, the more that any country is going to have to reassess the three kind of pillars of, of their generation. Number one, what's the technology they're putting in? Number two, what's the what are the layers of redundancy that they're requiring? And number three, what is the culture of safety in the regulatory environment that they're sort of imposing around this energy system? And I think those three might be different. The answers to them might be different in different countries. But all the countries around the world who are thinking about nuclear will need to look at all three of them. Chris, I want to come to you. And if you were to paint the worst case possible, in terms of being able to contain the disaster now at these nuclear power plants. If the Japanese officials say, look, we're just going to let it run its course, what does that mean? What does running its course mean in this situation? Well, you'll have a, um, a molten uh, mass of uh, spent fuel and metals at the bottom of these pools, and it'll be a very unpleasant situation for anybody going forward. And it'd be difficult to come back and deal with that at all because the radiation would sicken anybody that tries to get to these places. It's not a good scenario when you have spent fuel rods exposed to the atmosphere and we need to get water in there and cool them down and maintain the, the stop the tide that's going against it right now. Chris Kadomsky, thank you very much. Nathan Holtman, thank you very much. Coming